In classical mechanics, Newton's theorem of revolving orbits identifies the type of central force needed to multiply the angular speed of a particle by a factor k without affecting its radial motion. Newton applied his theorem to understanding the overall rotation of orbits that is observed for the moon and planets. The term radial motion signifies the motion towards or away from the center of force whereas the angular motion is perpendicular to the radial motion. Isaac Newton derived this theorem in Propositions 43 to 45 of Book 1 of his Philosophy and Naturalized Principia Mathematica, first published in 1687. In Proposition 43, he showed that the added force must be a central force one whose magnitude depends only upon the distance r between the particle and a point fixed in space. In Proposition 44, he derived a formula for the force, showing that it was an inverse cube force, one that varies as the inverse cube of r. In Proposition 45 Newton extended his theorem to arbitrary central forces by assuming that the particle moved in nearly circular orbit. As noted by astrophysicist Subramanian Chandra Sekhar in his 1995 commentary on Newton's Principia, this theorem remained largely unknown and undeveloped for over three centuries. Since 1997, the theorem has been studied by Donald Lyndon Bell and collaborators. Its first exact extension came in 2000 with the work of Muhammad and Vorda. Historical Context the motion of astronomical bodies has been studied systematically for thousands of years. The stars were observed to rotate uniformly, always maintaining the same relative positions to one another. However, other bodies were observed to wander against the background of the fixed stars. Most such bodies were called planets after the Greek word pi lambda alpha nu eta tau micron iota. 4. Wanderers Although they generally move in the same direction along a path across the sky, individual planets sometimes reverse their direction briefly, exhibiting retrograde motion. To describe this forward and backward motion, Apollonius of Perga developed the concept of deference and epicycles, according to which the planets are carried on rotating circles that are themselves carried on other rotating circles, and so on. Any orbit can be described with a sufficient number of judiciously chosen epicycles, since this approach corresponds to a modern Fourier transform. Roughly 350 years later, Claudius Ptolemaeus published his Almagest, in which he developed this system to match the best astronomical observations of his era. To explain the epicycles, Ptolemy adopted the geocentric cosmology of Aristotle, according to which planets were confined to concentric rotating spheres. This model of the universe was authoritative for nearly 1500 years. The modern understanding of planetary motion arose from the combined efforts of astronomer Tycho Brahe and physicist Johannes Kepler in the 16th century. Tycho is credited with extremely accurate measurements of planetary motions, from which Kepler was able to derive his laws of planetary motion. According to these laws, planets move on ellipses about the Sun. Kepler's second and third laws make specific quantitative predictions. Subsequent observations of the planetary orbits showed that the long axis of the ellipse rotates gradually with time. This rotation is known as apsidal precession. The apses of an orbit are the points at which the orbiting body is closest or furthest away from the attracting center for planets orbiting the Sun. The apses correspond to the perihelion and aphelion. With the publication of his Principia roughly 80 years later, Isaac Newton provided a physical theory that accounted for all three of Kepler's laws, a theory based on Newton's laws of motion and his law of universal gravitation. In particular, Newton proposed that the gravitational force between any two bodies was a central force F that varied as the inverse square of the distance R between them. Arguing from his laws of motion, Newton showed that the orbit of any particle acted upon by one such force is always a conic section, specifically an ellipse if it does not go to infinity. 
However, this conclusion holds only when two bodies are present, the motion of three bodies or more acting under their mutual gravitation remained unsolved, for centuries after Newton. Although solutions to a few special cases were discovered, Newton proposed that the orbits of planets about the Sun are largely elliptical because the Sun's gravitation is dominant, to first approximation. The presence of the other planets can be ignored. By analogy, the elliptical orbit of the Moon about the Earth was dominated by the Earth's gravity, to first approximation. The Sun's gravity and those of other bodies of the solar system can be neglected. However, Newton stated that the gradual apsidal precession of the planetary and lunar orbits was due to the effects of these neglected interactions, in particular. He stated that the precession of the Moon's orbit was due to the perturbing effects of gravitational interactions with the Sun. Newton's theorem of revolving orbits was his first attempt to understand apsidal precession quantitatively. According to this theorem, the addition of a particular type of central force, the inverse cube force, can produce a rotating orbit. The angular speed is multiplied by a factor, k, whereas the radial motion is left unchanged. However, this theorem is restricted to a specific type of force that may not be relevant. Several perturbing inverse square interactions seem unlikely to sum exactly to an inverse cube force. To make his theorem applicable to other types of forces, Newton found the best approximation of an arbitrary central force F to an inverse cube potential in the limit of nearly circular orbits, that is, elliptical orbits of low eccentricity, as is indeed true for most orbits in the solar system. To find this approximation, Newton developed an infinite series that can be viewed as the forerunner of the Taylor expansion. This approximation allowed Newton to estimate the rate of precession for arbitrary central forces. Newton applied this approximation to test models of the force causing the apsidal precession of the Moon's orbit. However, the problem of the Moon's motion is dauntingly complex, and Newton never published an accurate gravitational model of the Moon's apsidal precession. After a more accurate model by Clairaut in 1747, analytical models of the Moon's motion were developed in the late 19th century by Hill, Brown, and de Lunay. However, Newton's theorem is more general than merely explaining apsidal precession. It describes the effects of adding an inverse cube force to any central force F, not only to inverse square forces such as Newton's law of universal gravitation and Coulomb's law. Newton's theorem simplifies orbital problems in classical mechanics by eliminating inverse cube forces from consideration. The radial and angular motions, r and theta 1, can be calculated without the inverse cube force. Afterwards, its effect can be calculated by multiplying the angular speed of the particle mathematical statement. Consider a particle moving under an arbitrary central force F1 whose magnitude depends only on the distance r between the particle and a fixed center. Since the motion of a particle under a central force always lies in a plane, the position of the particle can be described by polar coordinates, the radius and angle of the particle relative to the center of force. Both of these coordinates, r and theta 1, change with time t as the particle moves. Imagine a second particle with the same mass m and with the same radial motion r, but one whose angular speed is k times faster than that of the first particle. In other words, the azimuthal angles of the two particles are related by the equation theta 2 equals k theta 1. Newton showed that the motion of the second particle can be produced by adding an inverse cube central force to whatever force F1 acts on the first particle where L1 is the magnitude of the first particle's angular momentum, which is a constant of motion for central forces. If K2 is greater than 1, F2 minus F1 is a negative number, thus, the added inverse cube force is attractive. 
as observed in the green planet of figures 1 to 4 and 9. By contrast, if k2 is less than 1, f2 minus f1 is a positive number. The added inverse cube force is repulsive, as observed in the green planet of figures 5 and 10, and in the red planet of figures 4 and 5. Alteration of the particle path The addition of such an inverse cube force also changes the path followed by the particle. The path of the particle ignores the time dependencies of the radial and angular motions, such as r and theta 1, rather, it relates the radius and angle variables to one another. For this purpose, the angle variable is unrestricted and can increase indefinitely as the particle revolves around the central point multiple times. For example, if the particle revolves twice about the central point and returns to its starting position, its final angle is not the same as its initial angle, rather, it has increased by 2 times 360 degrees equals 720 degrees. Formally, the angle variable is defined as the integral of the angular speed A similar definition holds for theta 2, the angle of the second particle. If the path of the first particle is described in the form r equals g, the path of the second particle is given by the function r equals g, since theta 2 equals k theta 1. For example, let the path of the first particle be an ellipse where a and b are constants, then, the path of the second particle is given by orbital precession. If k is close, but not equal, to 1, the second orbit resembles the first, but revolves gradually about the center of force, this is known as orbital precession. If k is greater than 1, the orbit precesses in the same direction as the orbit, if k is less than 1. The orbit processes in the opposite direction. Although the orbit in figure the third of May seem to rotate uniformly, i.e., at a constant angular speed, this is true only for circular orbits. If the orbit rotates at an angular speed omega, the angular speed of the second particle is faster or slower than that of the first particle by omega. In other words, the angular speeds would satisfy the equation omega 2 equals omega 1 plus omega. However, Newton's theorem of revolving orbits states that the angular speeds are related by multiplication. Omega 2 equals k omega 1, where k is a constant. Combining these two equations shows that the angular speed of the precession equals omega equals omega 1. Hence, omega is constant only if omega 1 is constant. According to the conservation of angular momentum, omega 1 changes with the radius r where m and l1 are the first particle's mass and angular momentum, respectively, both of which are constant. Hence, omega 1 is constant only if the radius r is constant, i.e., when the orbit is a circle. However, in that case, the orbit does not change as it processes. Illustrative example. Coates's spirals. The simplest illustration of Newton's theorem occurs when there is no initial force, i.e., f1 equals zero. In this case, the first particle is stationary or travels in a straight line. If it travels in a straight line that does not pass through the origin, the equation for such a line may be written in the polar coordinates is where theta zero is the angle at which the distance is minimized. The distance r begins at infinity, and decreases gradually until theta 1 theta 0 equals 0 degrees when the distance reaches a minimum, then gradually increases again to infinity at theta 1 theta 0 equals 90 degrees. The minimum distance b is the impact parameter, which is defined as the length of the perpendicular from the fixed center to the line of motion. The same radial motion is possible when an inverse cube central force is added. An inverse cube central force F2 has the form where the numerator mu may be positive or negative. If such an inverse cube force is introduced, Newton's theorem says that the corresponding solutions have a shape called Coates's spirals. These are curves defined by the equation where the constant k equals when the right-hand side of the equation is a positive real number.
the solution corresponds to an epispiral. When the argument theta 1 theta 0 equals plus or minus 90 degrees times k, the cosine goes to 0 and the radius goes to infinity. Thus, when k is less than 1, the range of allowed angles becomes small and the force is repulsive. On the other hand, when k is greater than 1, the range of allowed angles increases. Corresponding to an attractive force, the orbit of the particle can even wrap around the center several times. The possible values of the parameter k may range from 0 to infinity, which corresponds to values of mu ranging from negative infinity up to the positive upper limit, L12 per meter. Thus, for all attractive inverse cube forces there is a corresponding epispiral orbit, as for some repulsive ones, as illustrated in figure 7. Stronger repulsive forces correspond to a faster linear motion. One of the other solution types is given in terms of the hyperbolic cosine, where the constant lambda satisfies this form of Coates's spirals corresponds to one of the two point sots spirals. The possible values of lambda range from zero to infinity, which corresponds to values of mu greater than the positive number L12 per meter. Thus, Poinsot spiral motion only occurs for repulsive inverse cube central forces, and applies in the case that L is not too large for the given mu. Taking the limit of k or lambda going to zero yields the third form of a Coates's spiral, the so-called reciprocal spiral or hyperbolic spiral, as a solution where a and epsilon are arbitrary constants. Such curves result where the strength mu of the repulsive force exactly balances the angular momentum mass term closed orbits and inverse cube central forces. Two types of central forces, those that increase linearly with distance, F equals CR, such as Hooke's law, and inverse square forces, F equals C, R2, such as Newton's law of universal gravitation and Coulomb's law, have a very unusual property. A particle moving under either type of force always returns to its starting place with its initial velocity provided that it lacks sufficient energy to move out to infinity. In other words, the path of a bound particle is always closed and its motion repeats indefinitely, no matter what its initial position or velocity. As shown by Bertrand's theorem, this property is not true for other types of forces. In general, a particle will not return to its starting point with the same velocity. However, Newton's theorem shows that an inverse cubic force may be applied to a particle moving under a linear or inverse square force such that its orbit remains closed, provided that k equals a rational number. In such cases, the addition of the inverse cubic force causes the particle to complete m rotations about the center of force in the same time that the original particle completes n rotations. This method for producing closed orbits does not violate Bertrand's theorem, because the added inverse cubic force depends on the initial velocity of the particle. Harmonic and subharmonic orbits are special types of such closed orbits. A closed trajectory is called the harmonic orbit if k is an integer, i.e., if n equals 1 in the formula k equals m n. For example, if k equals 3, the resulting orbit is the third harmonic of the original orbit. Conversely, the closed trajectory is called a subharmonic orbit if k is the inverse of an integer, i.e., if m equals 1 in the formula k equals m n. For example, if k equals 1 third, the resulting orbit is called the third subharmonic of the original orbit. Although such orbits are unlikely to occur in nature, they are helpful for illustrating Newton's theorem. 